Chapters fifty eight through the epilogue of the right away by Gilbert Parker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter fifty eight with his back to the wall. In four days, ten thousand dollars in notes and gold had been brought to the office of the notary by the faithful people of Chaudier. All day in turn, M. Loisel and M. Rossignol sat in the office and received that which represented one fortieth of the value of each man's goods, estate, and wealth, the fortieth value of a wood sawer's cottage or a widow's garden. They did it impartially for all, as the curé and three of the best to do habitants had done for the seigneur, whose four thousand dollars had been paid in first of all. Charlie had been confined to his room for three days because of his injuries and a feverish cold he had caught, and the habitants did not disturb his quiet. But Mrs. Flynn took him broth made by Rosalie's hands, and Rosalie fought with her desire to go to him and nurse him. She was not, however, the Rosalie of the old impulse and impetuous resolve. The arrow had gone too deep. She waited till she could see his face again and looked into his eyes. Not apathy, but a sense of the inevitable was upon her, and pale and fragile, but with a calm spirit, she waited for she knew not what. She felt that the day of fate was closing down. She must hold herself ready for the hour when he would need her most. At first, when the conviction had come to her that the end of all was near, she had revolted. She had had impulse to go to him at all hazards, to say to him, Come away, anywhere, anywhere. But that had given place to the deeper thing in her, and something of Charlie's spirit of stoic waiting had come upon her. She watched the people going to the notary's office with their tributes and freewill offerings, and they seemed like people in a play. These days she lived no life which was theirs. It was a dream, unimportant and temporary. She was feeling what was behind all life, and permanent. It could not last, but there it was, and she could not return to the transitory till this cloud of fate was lifted. She was much too young to suffer so, but the young ever suffer most. On the fourth day she saw Charlie. He came from his shop and went to the notary's office. At first she was startled, for he was clean-shaven, the fire had burned his beard to the skin. She saw a different man, far removed from this life about them both, individual, singular. He was pale, and his eyeglass, with the clean-shaven face, gave an impression of refined separateness. She did not know that the same look was in both their faces. She watched him till he entered the notary shop, then she was called away to her duties. Charlie had come to give his one-fortieth with the rest. When he entered the notary's office, the Seigneur and M. Dauphin stood up to greet him. They congratulated him on his recovery, while feeling also that the change in his personal appearance somehow affected their relations. A crowd gathered round the door of the shop. When Charlie made his offering, with a statement of his goods and income, the Seigneur and notary did not know what to do they were disposed to decline it, for since Mansour was no Catholic it was not his duty to help. At this moment of delicate anxiety M. Loisel entered. With a swift bright flush to his cheek he saw the difficulty, and at once accepted freely. "'God bless you,' he said as he took the money, and Charlie left. "'It shall build the doorway of my church.' Later in the day the curé sent for Charlie. There were grave matters to consider, and his counsel was greatly needed. They had all come to depend on the soundness of his judgment. It had never gone astray in Chaudier, they said. They owed to him this extraordinary scheme, which would be an example to all modern Christianity. They told him so. He said nothing in reply. In an hour he had planned for them a scheme for the consideration of contractors, had drawn, with the help of M. Loisel, an architect's rough plan of the new church, and his old professional instincts keenly alive, had lucidly suggested the terms and safeguards of the contracts. Then came the question of the money contributed. The day before M. Dauphin and the Seigneur Stuart had arrived in safety from Quebec with twenty thousand dollars in bank bills. These M. Roy Signal had exchanged for the notes of hand 
of such of the habitants as had not ready cash to give. All of this twenty thousand dollars had been paid over. They had now thirty thousand dollars in cash, besides three thousand which the curé had at his house, the proceeds of the passion play. It was proposed to send this large sum to the bank in Quebec in another two days, when the whole contributions should be complete. As to the safety of the money, the timid M. Dauphin did not care to take responsibility. Strangers were still arriving, ignorant of the fact that the passion play had ceased, and some of them must be aware that this large sum of money was in the parish, no doubt also knew that it was in his house. It was therefore better, he urged, that M. Resignal or the curé should take charge of it. M. Loisel urged that secrecy as to the resting place of the money was important. It was better that it should be deposited in the most unlikely place, and with some unofficial person who might not be supposed to have it in charge. "'I have it,' said the Signor. "'The money shall be placed in old Louis Trudel's safe in the wall of the tailor's shop.' It was so arranged, after Charlie's protest of unwillingness, and counter-appeals from the others. That evening at sundown, thirty-three thousand dollars was deposited in the safe in the old stone wall of the tailor's shop, and the lock was sealed with the parish seal. But the notary's wife had wormed the secret from her husband, and she found it hard to keep. She told it to Maximilian Coeur, and he kept it. She told it to her cousin, the wife of Philly and Lacasse, and she did not keep it. Before twenty-four hours went round, a dozen people knew it. The evening of the second day another two thousand dollars was added to the treasure, and the lock was again sealed with the utmost secrecy. Charlie and Joe Portugais, the infidel and the murderer, were thus the sentries to the peace of a parish, the bankers of its gifts, the security for the future of the Church of Chaudier. Their weapons of defense were two old pistols belonging to the Seigneur. Money is the master of the unexpected, the Seigneur had said as he handed them over. He chuckled for hours afterwards as he thought of his epigram. That night, as he turned over in bed for the third time, as was his custom before going to sleep, another epigram came to him. Money is the only fox hunted night and day. He kept repeating it over and over again with vain pride. The truth of Embra Sigmal's aphorisms had been demonstrated several days before. On his return from Quebec with the twenty thousand dollars of the Seigneur's money, M. Dauphin had dwelt with great pride on the discretion and energy he and the steward had shown, had told dramatically of the skill which had enabled them to make a journey of such importance so secretly in safety, had covered himself with blushes for his own coolness and intrepidity. Fortune had, however, favored his reputation and his intrepidity, for he had been pursued from the hour he and his companion left Quebec. A taste for the picturesque had impelled him to arrange for two relays of horses, and this fact saved him and the twenty thousand dollars he carried. Two hours after he had left Quebec four determined men had got upon his trail, and had only been prevented from overtaking him by the freshness of the horses which his dramatic foresight had provided. The leader of these four pursuers was Billy Wantage, who had come to know of the curious action of the Seigneur of Chaudier from an intimate friend, a clerk in the bank. Billy's fortunes were now in a bad way, and in desperate straits for money he had planned this bold attempt at the highwayman's art with two gamblers to whom he owed money, and a certain notorious horse-trader of whom he had made a companion of late. Having escaped punishment for a crime once before, through Charlie's supposed death, the immunity nerved him to this later and more dangerous enterprise. The four rode as hard as their horses would permit, but M. Dauphin and his companion kept always an hour or more ahead, and from the high hills overlooking the village Billy and his friends saw the two enter it safely in the light of evening. His three friends urged Billy to turn back, since they were out of provisions and had no shelter. It was unwise to go to a tavern or a farmer's house, where they must certainly be suspected. Billy, however, determined to make an effort to find the banking place of the money, and refused to turn back without a trial. He therefore proposed that they should separate, going different directions, secure accommodation for the night, rest the following day, and meet the next night at a point indicated. 
This was agreed upon, and they separated. When the four met again, Billy had nothing to communicate, as he had been taken ill during the night before, and had been unable to go secretly into Chaudier village. They separated once more. When they met the next night, Billy was accompanied by an old confederate. As he was entering Chaudier the previous evening, he had met John Brown with his painted wagon and a new model horse. John Brown had news of importance to give, for in the stable-yard of the village tavern he had heard one habitant confide to another that the money for the new church was kept in the safe of the tailor shop. John Brown was as ready to share it in Billy's second enterprise as he had been to incite him to his first crime. So it was that as the Seigneur made his epigram and gloated over it, the five men, with horses at a convenient distance, armed to the teeth, broke stealthily into Charlie's house. They entered silently through the kitchen door and made their way into the little hall. Two stood guard at the foot of the stairs, and three crept into the shop. This night Joe Portugay was sleeping upstairs while Charlie lay upon the bench in the tailor shop. Charlie heard the door open, heard unfamiliar steps, seized his pistol, and springing up with his back to the safe, called out loudly to Joe. As he dimly saw the men rush at him, he fired. The bullet reached its mark, and one man fell dead. At that moment a dark lantern was turned full on Charlie, and a pistol was fired point-blank at him. As he fell, shot through the breast, the man who had fired dropped the lantern with a shriek of terror. He had seen the ghost of his brother-in-law, Charlie Steele. With a quaking cry of warning to others, Billy bolted from the house, followed by his companions, two of whom were struggling with Joe Portugay on the stairway. These now also broke and ran. Joe rushed into the shop and saw, as he thought, Charlie lying dead, saw the robber dead upon the floor. His master and friend gone, the conviction seized him that his own time had come. He would give himself to justice now but to God's justice, not to man's. The robbers were four to one, and he would avenge his master's death and give his own life to do it. It was all the thought of a second. He rushed out after the robbers, shouting as he ran to awake the villagers. He heard the marauders ahead of him, and fleet of foot rushed on. Reaching them as they mounted, he fired and brought down his men, a shivering quack doctor who, like his leader, had seen a sight in the tailor's shop that struck terror to his soul. Two of the others then fired at Joe, who had caught a horse by the head. He fell without a sound and lay upon his face. He did not hear the hoofs of the escaping horses, nor any other sound. He had fallen without a pang beside the quack doctor, whose medicines would never again quicken a pulse in his own body or any other. Behind in the village frightened people flocked about the tailor shop. Within Mrs. Flynn and the notary crudely but tenderly bound up the dreadful wound in Charlie's side, while Rosalie pillowed his head on her bosom. With a strange quietness Rosalie gave orders to the notary and Mrs. Flynn. There was a light in her eyes, an unnatural light, of strength and presence of mind. Her hand was steady, and as gently as a mother with a child she wiped the moist forehead and poured a little brandy between the set teeth. "'Stand back! Give him air!' she said in a voice of authority to those who crowded round. People fell back in awe, for amid tears and excitement and fear this girl had a strange convincing calm. By the time Charlie's wound was stopped, messengers were on the way to the curé and the seigneur. By Rosalie's instructions the dead body of the robber was removed, Charlie's bed upstairs was prepared for him, a fire was lighted, and twenty hands were ready to do accurately her will. Now and again she felt his pulse, and she watched his face intently. In her bitter sorrow her heart had a sort of thankfulness, for his head was on her breast, he was in her arms. It had been given her once more to come first to his rescue, and with one wild cry, unheard by any one, to call out his beloved name. The world of Chaudier, roused by the shooting, had then burst in upon them, but that one moment had been hers, no matter what came after. She had no illusions, she knew that the end was near, the end of all for him and for them both. The curé entered and hurried forward. 
there was the seal of the parish intact on the door of the safe but at what cost he has given his life for the church he said then commanded all to leave save those needed to carry the wounded man upstairs still it was rosalie that directed the removal she held his hand she saw that he was carefully laid down she raised his head to a proper height she moistened his lips and fanned him meanwhile the cure fell upon his knees and the noise of talk and whispering ceased in the house but presently there was loud murmuring and shuffling of feet outside again and rosalie left the room hurriedly and went below to stop it she met the men who were bringing the body of joe portugais into the shop upstairs the cure's voice prayed of thy mercy o lord hear our prayer grant that he be brought into thy church ere his last hour come forgive o lord charlie stirred and opened his eyes he saw the cure bowed in prayer he heard the trembling voice he touched the white head with his hand End of chapter fifty eight chapter fifty nine in which charlie meets a stranger the cure came to his feet with a joyful cry monsieur my son he said bending over him is it all over charlie asked calmly almost cheerfully death now was the only solution of life's problems and he welcomed it from the void the cure went to the door and locked it the deepest desire of his life must here be uttered his great aspiration be realized my son he said as he came softly to the bedside again you have given to us all you had your charity your wisdom your skill you have it was hard but the man's wound was mortal and it must be said you have consecrated our new church with your blood you have given all to us we will give all to you there was a soft knocking at the door he went and opened it a very little he is conscious rosalie wait wait one moment then came the signor's voice saying that joe was gone and that all the robbers had escaped save the two disposed of by charlie and joe the cure turned to the bed once more what did he say about joe charlie asked he is dead my son and the quack doctor also the others have escaped charlie turned his face away au revoir joe he said into the great distance then there was silence for a moment while outside the door a girl prayed with an old woman's arm around her the cure leaned over charlie again shall not the sacraments of the church comfort you in your last hours he said it is the way the truth and the life it is the voice that says peace to the vexed mind human intellect is vanity only the soul survives will you not hear the voice will you not give us who love and honor you the right to make you ours for ever will you not come to the bosom of that church for which you have given all tell them so charlie said and he motioned towards the window under which the people were gathered with a glad exclamation the cure hastened to the window and in a voice of sorrowful exultation spoke to the people below charlie reckoned swiftly with his fate what was there now to do if his wound was not mortal what tragedy might now come for billy's hand the hand of kathleen's brother had brought him low if the robbers and murderers were captured he must be dragged into the old life and to what an issue all the old problems carried into more terrible conditions and rosalie in his half-consciousness he had felt her near him he had felt her near him now rosalie in any case what could there be for her nothing he had heard the cure whisper her name at the door she was outside praying for him he stretched out a hand as though he saw her and his lips framed her name in his weakness and fading life he had no anguish in the thought of her life and love were growing distant though he loved her as few love and live she would be removed from want by him there were the pearls and the money in the safe with the money of the church there was a letter to the cure his last testament leaving all to her he sleeping would fear no foe she awake in the living world 
would hold him in dear remembrance. Death were the better thing for all. Then Kathleen in her happiness would be at peace, and even Billy might go unmolested, for who was there to recognize Billy, now that Portugais was dead? He heard the curé's voice at the window. Oh, my dear people, God has given him to us at last. I go now to prepare him for his long journey. To, Charlie realized and shuddered, receive the sacraments of the church, be made ready by the priest for his going hence, and all the soul's interrogations with the solving of his own mortal problems, say, I believe, confess his sins, and receiving absolution lie down in peace he suddenly raised himself on his elbow flinging his body over the bandage of his wound was displaced and blood gushed out upon the white cloths of the bed rosalie he gasped rosalie my love god keep as he sank back he heard the priest's anguished voice above him calling for help he smiled rosalie he whispered the priest ran and unlocked the door and Rosalie entered, followed by the Seigneur and Mrs. Flynn. "'Quick, quick!' said the priest. The bandage slipped. Or was it slipped? Who knows? Blind with agony, and as in a direful dream, Rosalie made her way to the bed. The sight of his ensanguined body roused her, and murmuring his name, continually murmuring his name, she assisted Mrs. Flynn to bind up the wound again. Standing where she stood, when she had stayed Louis Trudel's arm long ago, with an infinite tenderness she touched the scar, the scar of the cross on his breast. Terrible as was her grief, her heart had its comfort in the thought, who could rob her of that forever, that he would die a martyr. It did not matter now who knew the story of her love. It could not do him harm. She was ready to proclaim it to all the world, and those who watched knew that they were in the presence of a great human love. The priest made ready to receive the unconscious man into the church. Had Charlie not said, Tell them so? Was it not now his duty to say the sacred offices over a son of the church in his last bitter hour? So it was done while he lay unconscious. For hours he lay still, and then the fevered blood, poisoned by the bullet which had brought him down, made him delirious, gave him hallucinations, open-eyed illusions. All the time Rosalie knelt at the foot of the bed, her piteous tearless eye forever fixed on his face. Towards evening, with an unnatural strength, he sat up in bed. See, he whispered, that woman in the corner there, she has come to take me but I will not go. Fantasy after fantasy possessed him, fantasy strangely mixed with facts of his own past. Now it was Kathleen, now Billy, now Joe Portugais, now John Brown, now Suzanne Charlemagne at the Côte d'Orion, again Joe Portugais. In strange, touching sentences he spoke to them as though they were present before him. At length he stopped abruptly and gazed straight before him over the head of Rosalie into the distance. See, he said, pointing, who is that? Who? I can't see his face. It is covered. So tall, so white. He is opening his arms to me. He is coming closer, closer, closer. Who is it? It is death, my son, said the priest in his ear, with a pitying gentleness. The curé's voice seemed to calm the agitated sense, to bring it back to the outer precincts of understanding. There was an awestruck silence as the dying man fumbled, fumbled over his breast, found his eyeglass, and with a last feeble effort raised it to his eye, shining now with an unearthly fire. The old interrogation of the soul, the elemental habit, outlived all else in him. The idiosyncrasy of the mind, automatically expressed itself. "'I beg your pardon,' he whispered to the imagined figure, and the light died out of his eyes. "'Have I ever been introduced to you?' 
at the hour of your birth my son said the priest as a sobbing cry came from the foot of the bed but charlie did not hear his ears were forever closed to the voices of life and time End of chapter fifty nine chapter sixty the hand at the door the eve of the day of the memorable funeral two belated visitors to the passion play arrived in the village unknowing that it had ended and of the tragedy which had set a whole valley mourning unconscious that they shared in the bitter fortunes of the tailor man of whom men and women spoke with tears affected by the gloom of the place the two visitors at once prepared for their return journey but the manner of the tailor man's death arrested their sympathies touched the humanity in them the woman was much impressed they asked to see the body of the man they were taken to the door of the tailor shop while their horses were being brought round within the house itself they were met by an old irish woman who in response to their wish to see the brave man's body showed them into a room where a man lay dead with a bullet through his heart it was the body of joe portugay whose master and friend lay in another room across the hallway the lady turned back in disappointment the dead man was little like a hero the irishwoman had meant to deceive her for at this moment a girl who loved a tailor was kneeling beside his body and if possible mrs flynn would have no curious eyes look upon that scene when the visitors came into the hall again the man said there was another kathleen a woodsman but standing by the nearly closed door behind which lay the dead tailor of chaudier they could see the holy candles flickering within kathleen whispered we've seen the tailor that's enough it's only the woodsman there i prefer not tom with his fingers at the latch the man hesitated even as mrs flynn stepped apprehensively forward then shrugging a shoulder she responded to kathleen's hand on his arm they went down the stairs together and out to their carriage as they drove away kathleen said it's strange that men who do such fine things should look so commonplace the other one might have been more uncommon he replied i wonder she said with a sigh of relief as they passed the bounds of the village then she caught herself flushing for she suddenly realized that the exclamation was once so often on the lips of a dead disgraced man whose name she once had borne if the door of the little room had opened to the fingers of the man beside her the tailor of chaudier though dead would have been dearly avenged End of chapter sixty chapter sixty one the cure speaks the cure stood with his back to the ruins of the church at his feet two newly made graves and all round with wistful faces crowds of reverent habitants a benignant sorrow made his voice in perfect temper with the pensive striving of this latest day of spring at the close of his address he said i owe you much my people i owe him more for it was given him who knew not god to teach us how to know him better for his past it is not given you to know it is hidden in the bosom of the church sinner he once was criminal never as one can testify who knows all he turned to the abbe rossignol who stood beside him grave and compassionate and his sins were forgiven him he is the one sheaf which you and i may carry home rejoicing from the pagan world of unbelief what he had in life he gave to us and in death he leaves to our church all that he has not left to a woman he loved to rosalie evanterel there was a ghastly murmur among the people but they stilled again and strained to hear he leaves her a little fortune and to us all else he had let us pray for his soul and let us comfort her who loving deeply reaped no harvest of love the law may never reach his ruthless murderers for there is none to recognize their faces and were they ten times punished how should it avail us now 
let us always remember that in his grave our friend bears on his breast the little iron cross we held so dear that is all we could give our dearest treasure i pray god that scarring his breast in life it may heal all his woes in death and be a saving image on his bosom in the presence at the last he raised his hands in benediction End of chapter 61 epilogue never again was there a passion play in the chaudier valley spring times and harvests and long winters came and went and a blessing seemed to be upon the valley for men prospered and no untoward things befell the people so it was for twenty years wherein there had been coming and going in quiet some had gone upon short mortal journeys and had come back some upon long immortal journeys and had never returned of the last were the seigneur and a woman once a magdalene but in a house beside a beautiful church with a noble doorway lived the cure and loisel aged and serene there never was a day come rain or shine in which he was not visited by a beautiful woman whose life was one with the people of the valley there was no sorrow in the parish which the lady did not share with the help of an old irish woman called mrs flynn was there sickness in the parish her hands smoothed the pillow and soothed the pain was there trouble anywhere her face brought light to the doorway did any suffer ill repute her word helped to restore the ruined name they did not know that she forgave so much in all the world because she thought she had so much in herself to forgive. She was ever called Madame Rosalie, and she cherished the name and gave commands that when her grave came to be made near to a certain other grave, Madame Rosalie should be carved upon the stone. Cheerfulness and serenity were ever with her, undisturbed by wish to probe the mystery of the life which had once absorbed her own. She never sought to know whence the man came, it was sufficient to know whither he had gone and that he had been hers for a brief dream of life it was better to have lived the one short thrilling hour with all its pain than never to have known what she knew or felt what she had felt the mystery deepened her romance and she was even glad that the ruffians who slew him were never brought to justice to her mind they were but part of the mystic machinery of fate for her the years had given many compensations and so she told the cure one midsummer day when she brought to visit him the orphan son of paulette dubois graduated from college in france and making ready to go to the far east i have had more than i deserve a thousand times she said the cure smiled and laid a gentle hand upon her own it is right for you to think so he said but after a long life I am ready to say that one way or another we earn all the real happiness we have. I mean the real happiness, the moments, my child. I once had a moment full of happiness. May I ask, she said, when my heart first went out to him, he turned his face towards the churchyard. He was a great man, she said proudly. The curé looked at her benignly. She was a woman and she had loved the man. He had, however, come to a stage of life where greatness alone seemed of little moment. He forbore to answer her, but he pressed her hand. This is the end of The Right Away by Gilbert Parker Recording by Tom Weiss TomsAudiobooks.com